So, one question before. Who's playing with the pins ejection? Everybody. Come on, a little bit more. Who's playing with Java EE? And then you say no dependency injection? Come on. <laughs> okay. Um, Spring? Okay. So, well, let's start. My name is Sven, and it's a pleasure to earn my money since 1996 with Java. But the other side is, if you ask me something about other languages, I have no idea. I never learned something different. So, during the time I was working, and at the moment I'm working for an Italian company, so I'm head of R&D, so my task is to play around the whole day. Um, but it's always the same. It doesn't matter if you are from an automobile industry or if you're working for insurance or banks or whatever, mostly I'm getting old projects. So who's working on projects? that are running six months, unlimited budget, no project lead. Uh, okay, nobody, yeah? Huh? Well, same for me. So the problem is mostly that I'm working on, on, on really old code bases. And the main problem is that during the time you're working on this code bases, a lot of other guys try to work on it. And on the other side, who's talking with your colleagues during the time you're working? Wow, one. <laughs> okay, it will include chatting, maybe. Okay, and this is the biggest problem. So nobody's talking to each other, and this you can find inside your code. Huh? Well, one thing is that I want to, to talk a little bit about dependency injection. And some hidden PLC means it could be a framework, but it could be a pattern, it could be an idea, some different things. So, one target we want to reach is, for example, divide a system into modules. This means that you try to get rid of dependencies and all this stuff. Huh? Anyone is working on microservices just now? Okay, call. Yeah, everybody knows it, sure. Well, it's a pleasure. In the moment, my management is leading to microservices. That means you have to build a lot of small and tiny pieces running independently. Yeah? So, but the biggest problem is the code, the code base I have is only one big thing. Well, this leads to decouple contract and implementation. Well, easy to say, but what does it mean? What does it mean? I don't know. Uh, maybe, maybe I'm thinking about it. And dependency injection frameworks, it would be nice if you could decrease complexity. Who would say dependency injection frameworks will decrease complexity? Okay, other way around, increasing the complexity? Okay, no answer, huh? time for B. So, maybe you need something new or something different in your um, old and big applications or new applications or whatever. So the possibility to choose the best implementation at runtime. What does, could it, or what does it mean at runtime? A decision during your starting your container? Well, the other thing is maybe you want to apply a patch at runtime only with core Java stuff, or remove a patch again. Okay, who fixed one at runtime a production system? Well, everybody, eh? At night, two o'clock. Or much more. For example, you want to have something that is implemented in one part, and you want to distribute it over the whole application, like metrics, logging, or technical aspects, or the possibility to implement a remote proxy at some places to decouple your application. So, but let's start with the basics. Um, please don't ask if this code makes sense. It's only an example. But 
What's the difficult part here? Or what's the bad part here? Any ideas? It, yeah, it depends. It's a, the it's a best answer. No? It depends. So let's say um, I have there something with a list. List of data. Data is some class. But this generic stuff, well, we will see later, is, is not always easy to handle. But you learned that you want to, if you want to decouple something, you're using interfaces. Anybody would say no? Uh, huh? OK. But on the other side, you have something like this inside. So who says this is a good decision? A bad decision? No idea? <laughs> I have no idea. Why? Other way around. So, Who's using normally an array list? Say the true. Who's using an array list per default? OK, and now the next question, why? So I, I met an example with a team I had. So we were using an, an, an IDE that's open source. So I fixed it a little bit and corrected in a way that per default, a linked list was it was chosen by the ID. Immediately, I could see everywhere in the code linked lists. And then I asked my colleagues, why? And they said, oh, well, the ID is clever, suggested it, maybe some static code analysis or whatever. So no idea. OK. So I think every list the makes are using because it's a general purpose list, whatever. Well, let's see. So I have something like an import there. Both is something that's in static semantics. So the decision, new array list and the static import, and both I want to get rid of. So if you never use something like a method trim to size, OK, say the truth. Who knows that trim to size is from array list? Uh, there's a big problem. Nearly nobody. And this is the truth. So if you're asking for special implementation, some, some special methods, it's really difficult to say, OK, this is a, a difference between two implementations. So if you don't need to access this trim to size or any special method, I want to get rid of error list, of this dependency, definitely, completely. No dependency there. OK. So. Um, this will lead to some questions. So the main question the dependency injection framework will try to give you an answer is, what will be the right implementation? Hmm. But if you are thinking about this, the next one will be, what's the right time to decide this is the right implementation? And the third question would be, how often you could decide. Huh? So that means, what's the right frequency to decide? And the dependency injection framework will give you help to all these three questions. Some dependency injection frameworks more or less, but how to give a dependency injection framework the possibility to give you answers to this one. Let's see. Let's start with core Java. Um, some people would say, OK, I want to get rid of this dependency. And they started with a design pattern called List Factory. Anybody here that don't know the design pattern factory? No, please, don't, don't raise your hand. OK. <laughs> so um, the main thing is that in your List Factory, you have an import of list. Yeah, you're, you're getting back an interface or something casted to an interface. And then you have a method like this. This method is good. I see this quite often. The next one I could see is something like uh, array list. This one. Create a linked list. Well, and then my list and some list and whatever list. And then you're using in your code something like this. But it's exactly the same. If, if you say new array list or create array list, it's, there's no difference. Hmm. So I'm a very smart guy, so I will create something like create list method. And then inside, I have a decision, new array list. Good. So in my code, 
I have reduced this one. But let's compare both things. So I could have an import. I don't want to have an import. I could have a special name method. I don't want to have this method. And inside my generic method, I could have a fixed decision. I want to get rid of all of this. So any goal I reached? Let's compare. The old one was something like a list. And the new one will have an import with list. So no difference. The next one would be an import with array list. and then clear decision for an array list. And here in my example, I have the static method, create array list, good. You can say create list, then you have merely the same. And you have an import list factory. Is an import list factory better than array list? Definitely no. Because inside your factory, normally you have all dependencies. <clears throat> I would say it's worse. Next question you have to think about, what's the right time to decide? So normally, you're talking about scopes. So mostly, you will have dependency injection frameworks with application or singleton scope, something like session scope. Does make it sense in desktop applications? Request scope, method scope. But these are all technical scopes. Who's implementing technical programs? OK, other way around, who's implementing business applications? Well, why not having business scopes? I have no idea. Well, why you don't have business scopes in your dependency injection frameworks? So you have to build something for yourself. OK, let's say if, if you can start dealing with these questions, and the next thing is a dependency injection framework is built in Java. So this will lead you to some technical aspects. For example, how to connect two instances. It's a basic question, huh? But the result is sometimes not easy to deal with. But let's say we have an interface called service, and I have something like an implementation, and I have the possibility to use this one to connect both. That means with a constructor. Who likes a constructor dependency connection, whatever thing? Is this a good decision? Yes or no? Yes, you have to say yes, huh? You raise your hand. OK. <laughs> well, this is one thing. The next thing you could do is you could say, OK, I have a dedicated method to connect both instances. I really want to have this method? Sometimes. Sometimes I don't want to have this. So why a dependency injection framework will force me to have some methods like this? So an explicit setter. Mm. OK. So, Last but not least, the only thing you could do now is reflection. So these are the three points, you, or the three ways a dependency injection could use to connect two instances. That's it. If you choose a dependency injection framework, the dependency injection framework will decide this is the right way. This will lead you to some issues in your business application. Let's say. I will use a constructor uh, way of connecting things. Then I have a time point, create the instance of the service. OK, I have it. Then the business module, or maybe a reverse. But first, I have to create both. And then I can connect both and, oh, no, not reverse. Sorry, theta here, create service. Then you have the constructor, my fault. And then you can invoke this. That means if you have a service that started now, then you're creating the implementation, putting it inside, because the service must be started. And three days later, the first invoke will come. Do we have a chance to make a good decision for the implementation of the service? Maybe. The next thing is, if you have a setter, you have something like create instance of the module. You can create the service to completely independent times, a third time only to connect both. It could be a second before you're using it, and then you can invoke the method. You have more possibilities to play around. Huh? And the same with reflection. You can create one, you can create two, and then you can connect both, and then you can invoke. This means 
two ways with more time points to make good decisions and one that is quite limited. So if you're using the explicit method or reflection, you have more possibilities to make decisions, and this is important. Okay, every framework will have a strategy how to resolve what's the right implementation. We will have a look at it. Then create and set an instance and manage the timeline. So, but how I could say all this to my dependency injection framework? And now we have different ways with more or less work. Who knows Welt? That's a reference implementation, huh? You must know it. For CDI, C for context dependency injection. What context mean? Well, let's see. But what we have is, is something to manage time lives, post construct and all this. You have something like working with qualifier and alternatives, I will have a look at it, and something like scopes, good. And interceptor and decorators, mm, part of it, whatever this means, stereotypes, you can combine qualifiers, events. What's part of a dependency injection framework? What must be inside the dependency injection framework to be full functional? Events? Yes or no? It depends. Huh? Yeah. Okay. So I, I would focus on something that is a minimum requirement. I would say it's a personal interpretation of this, but you can have other feelings about it. So I would say, okay, a dependency injector with qualifier and alternative is something you need in a dependency injection framework to work. You need something to deal with life cycles and something like scopes. Okay, maybe you have something like events, maybe. I think it's an optional feature. Okay, let's say, what's a way to, to s give an answer? For example, with qualifier and alternatives. You have this interface and you have one implementation. And you want to write something like this. You want to have only a net inject, you want to have an inter uh, interface and then your attribute. Is this decision easy? I think, yeah. Because we have only one interface, one implementation, the framework would say this fits. And if you have something like this, your second implementation, this is a problem if you are talking with your colleagues or not, huh? is implementing something. So now you have two implementations. It's not nothing bad. What will happen? A conflict, yeah, sure. Something like this. Perfect. What does it say? It would say, okay, I have no idea how to deal with this. The good thing is you only have to copy paste weld and this number and you will get a lot of answers. Huh? There's a good of this, but the information from the system is not very good. But the only thing you could do now is that you mark something in your source codes. You have this at prot at the second one. This is something in your static semantics. You're putting something to your code to make a decision. Hmm. Well, let's see. This is okay. To get the other one, you have to do something like inject at pot. This is the same. You have an explicit decision with a qualifier. You don't want to have this one, I think, because there's no difference between new array list or add prod. Okay, let's see. What we want to do now is we want to see what's a way to, to influence the way of how to produce an instance. Here it is with a producer. If you have a special producer, you have to write it inside your source code. Inject, producer, and something. It's inside your static semantics. I don't want to have it here because it's a fixed decision. The only thing you could do is that you could manage something inside your producer. So the whole logic you have to put inside the producer to decide what's going on. And this will lead to design pattern like this if you want to make CDI a little bit more dynamic at this point. Okay. Alternatives. Something you find quite often in the PINC injection framework. This means you have something like this, but you have to write it inside your beans XML. It's a static decision inside a configuration that's loaded one time during startup. Well, and you have to write something at your implementation. Why this is an alternative, not the other one? 
I have no idea. Okay. So, we want to get rid of all this stuff. Let's say, how to get an instance. Normally, I want to have something like this at inject server somewhere. It's an attribute inside your class. Okay, during your creating the whole, that everything will be created at the same time. Otherwise, you have to inject at methods as params. But you can do it a little bit more programmatically inside a method, for example. Container, select this interface and give me something. This is a little bit more dynamic. So the next one is if you have something like an instance, it's a virtual proxy. Okay, give me an instance and later I will decide or later will be the time to get the instance. So the timeline is more and more shifted to the point of invocation. No? And you can do this programmatically if you want to get rid, for example, of this annotation. You would say, okay, I have here an annotation literal and this is something equivalent to at pod, at dev, whatever. Now you can decide during runtime what you want to have. It's a little bit more like this. And the same with the producer. Okay. But you can do it manually. Who tried to inject manually at an instance? because you want to have more control about the inject itself. You can write a method and do everything programmatically. You say, okay, here's my instance, and then you have all this technical stuff depending on the bean container. Well, creating all this stuff, and then I saw something like this, and then they stopped. Wow, and they forgot this one, post-construct. And during this time, I had two different versions of instance in my application was not so nice. But here, you could change the way of how to create and all the stuff, so you have an individual inject created, more or less. Okay, this is the spec. This is what you're getting with every EE server. So there's one other project called Boondi. It's the first one I want to explain a little bit more. For example, if you don't have to deal with Java EE server, or if you don't have to huge and full e ecosystem like Spring, then you can choose between different dependency injection frameworks because you have only a small microservice. This Boon is quite easily bootstrapped. Uh, it's only one dependency you have to use, and there's no other dependency. And if you want to have the official CDI at inject markers, then you can use this one additionally, and then you can work with both. So if you start exploring a little bit different dependency injection frameworks, for example, Boondii, you will find out, okay, there's some decision because he says, no scopes. Could be interesting. Why not? But Boone is not using annotation processing and bytecode, and this immediately means this is a dependency injection framework that's only based on reflection with pro and contra. This means here the interesting thing is that, for example, he will work with post-construct, and if you have a service that's injecting a service and all this stuff, make sure that you analyze in which way the post-construct is used from parent to child, or from child to parent, what's the right order? But mostly, you have to define now what is an object graph. Mostly, or the most dependency injection frameworks are using something like static methods, for example, and then this construct of modules. And the module is nothing else as how to describe your object graph. This means you have something like, okay, please build this module with this service class, and then you can ask this module, give me a reference. If you're doing this, it will immediately, if you have the service with a subservice injected, a uh, null inside your subservice, because you have to make sure that everything that you could use or that is necessary, you have to declare inside your object graph. And then you can say, create a context, give me something, and then you have a fully instantiated object. Okay, I can create the object graph. This means I can create different object graphs at the same time. What's a good thing? What's a bad thing here? Okay, 
to make sure that everything is inside could be hard work and be bigger projects. So if you're exploring the possibilities from different DI frameworks, please think about how to deal with huge object graphs. So the good thing here is that you could or must build the object graph by yourself, but you must do it at runtime. So you have to code all this stuff, and then it must be executed. Then you could have different object graphs, so you can specialize every object graph so that you don't have to make decisions at runtime to shorten your path you have to walk through. And you have to make sure that you are creating complete object graphs. Okay, this means that with this, you could have different things and you have to make sure that the object graphs are not overlapping with instances that are migrating between different object graphs. The other thing is that you have something like a producer. If you're working with reflection, you're analyzing all this stuff at runtime. And here you can do the same. You can create uh, factory methods. It's OK. And the most important thing here is that you have to check how to deal or how to they are solving multiple producer things here. Because this one looks like naming conventions. And naming conventions in this way are definitely not uh, refactoring safe. So if you're using the Pensy injection framework, you have to deal longer with your project, make sure that you have ideas how to refactor all this stuff. But there was one interesting thing. Jürgen Zatama was exploring this one. It's not a bad dependency injection framework, really. It's, it's, it's nice, but you have to think a little bit. And this is an example how to make sure that sometimes implicit things are not killing you. Let's say I have a module because I can add and remove modules at runtime, because at runtime I'm creating object graph, that's nice. So this means I have a provider, A, B, C. And inside the provider, if it is used, I'm writing on screen A, 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 B, A, C. Because then I want to make sure that I have a second module. And then I have the same, provide service A, service B, and service C. So what will happen now? I started creating two different modules. And every time I'm invoking something, you will see, or you have to make sure, which one of these producers will be used. Okay. You could see it later if you see an AA, or you would see a BA, BC, B, um, and BB, and all this stuff. So let's check. I created something like this here to say, OK, with a module A, I have a context, an object graph. And then I would say, OK, please give me a reference. Which one of these producers would be used? OK, who say AA, AB, AC? AB. And the first time I was using it, I had no idea why. So make sure. If you're testing the Pensy injection framework, so you're explicitly testing what's the behavior and then digging down to, to see what's going on. And then I says, OK, add module B, because I can add modules, and getting a reference, and again, AB. And the next one, OK, maybe it's, it's a immutable, whatever. It's fancy now. AB, OK, nothing changed. And then adding both modules at the same time, getting something, AB, oh my god. So I have six producers, and he's always using A, B. And the other one, no error message, no logging, nothing. So reverse. Starting with B. Context, what I'm getting? B, B. <clears throat> OK. Then the same again. I'm playing around, adding module A. It's again B, B, and so on. So the good thing is that it's straightforward, this behavior. The only thing is why it's choosing BB. So it must be something with this how to deal with implicit things in dependency injection frameworks. So if you're checking now what internally happens, you have to go through the source code and analyze. I have only two possibilities, AB and BB here. So I'm reducing this one and say, OK, now I'm creating module A, module B. A1, module A2, module B1, module B2, and I started to play a little bit around if something will change here. So I added module A, B1, A2, B2, 
And who says A, B? Who says B, B? Okay, I'm C. No, no. A, B. Okay, let's go down. Remove a module. And immediately, I'm getting B, B. Okay. So make sure, if you depends the injection framework, so you can manipulate the object graph. Make sure that you have an idea what's going on if you're manipulating it, if something will be overridden, yes or no, and what's the behavior here. And if you're playing a little bit around here, it's alternating between A, B, and so on. Um, and if you're checking it like this, make sure that you're removing everything. And here, it's only null. It's not an exception. So only to make sure what, what was going on here is I was able to find a piece of code that says, OK, search for method that starts with provide. And this makes sure, aha, provide something doesn't matter. So all provide methods are collected. And then only the return type is a hint for what you're using this provide method. So I was digging a little bit inside. So the main thing is, what's the right, oh, if you have a class and says get declared methods, in which order in this array the declared methods are? Who says in order inside the class it's written down? Okay, or maybe alphabetically, or whatever, it's worse. It's definitely not sorted. If you're calling it a few times, you're getting different answers. This couldn't be leading to AA or BB constantly. So here, the thing was inside a map he is using, and he was using explicitly a concurrent hash map. And the key was a string, and this is an order. So this means if you're checking this concurrent hash map and putting all this stuff inside, you will get something like this. And the last one that's coming out is always a B version in this example. Okay, what I want to say with this, if you have something like this, a special behavior inside your dependency injection framework, all your colleagues or some of them will start using this and dealing with this. If you're working a long time with dependency injection frameworks, then make sure that you learn something like, if you're using a dependency injection framework, test it, definitely, and decide how to deal with this behavior. In this case, you have to get rid of it or not, and then write tests against this behavior to make sure that between implementations or versions of this dependency injection framework, the behavior is the same. Maybe this guy is changing concurrent hash map to something else, and the whole dependency injection is working differently. This is something that's working on reflection, so you can only work with reflection-based information, and the next one would be Dagger. Dagger is something completely different. It's for Java and Android, and the main thing is that here, again, you have something like a business module, and then you can ask this business module for an instance. And then you say, inject. This will lead to some interesting things. So everything together is, again, hard-coded. So from XML to Java, well, you have a main interface or a main service, and then you have a service implementation. Then you have to make sure that both will be connected. And this one is working with annotation processing. That means every decision must be done or everything must be done during compile time. Because after this, you're not using any information. It must be statically inside your code. So this means, OK, you have here something like an implementation. This is, for example, not managed. You have to say, OK, this will provide something. And then you have to build modules again. So again, we are working with modules. And you have to build the whole object graph, but in source code. And then here, with Dagger 1, the bad thing is you have to mark all possible targets. This means decreasing complexity with a way like this is definitely not the right thing because you are writing everything now in, uh, in source code. And the next thing is you can do something like this. That's you say, I have different providers with special marks A and B so that you have alternatives with producers. And if you want to have a little bit more dynamic things inside, if you're working with annotation processing, you only could do it, for example, inside a producer, because then you can decide something. All the other things 
must be generated. And if you want to have this one, the bad thing is that no dependency injection framework I know from the official one or the big one will give you an infrastructure to make dynamic um, decisions. So everything you have to write by yourself. And here in this example, the most dependency injection frameworks will give you the possibility not to create instance, but to create, for example, hey, come on. Yeah, I was playing around with animation, sorry. It was really, it was one of my first things I have done with Keynote and, well. The ma main thing is that you can start with virtual proxies. But the main thing is, what could be a virtual proxy? So, dependency injection frameworks are mostly a practical usage of proxies. Because this is a way to implement different behaviors in different parts and only implement it once. Well, I will come to this point a little bit later. The main thing is, if you want to build modules with this, again, you have to combine modules, and this means that you have to make sure that all this will fit together to build an object graph over different modules, and this could be, well, hard work. Okay. The good thing is, if you're working with annotation processing, this means mostly if you have for example, all possibilities here marked, you have to do it by yourself, and you're using something like name B somewhere, you can write it, your IDE couldn't give you a hint that this is not available. The compile process will break. It's not bad, but you have to compile and compile and compile all this stuff. Okay. Let's say, if you have this object graph, you're creating at runtime your object graph, so you can build different object graphs again. And this will say, okay, give me A, give me B. And then, something you could do like this. Not good, huh? So you have an instance created, and then you will give it to the object graph A, and then to the object graph B. The dependency injection frameworks normally are not giving you any warning that this one is already injected or already instantiated or whatever. And now you have mixed graphs. This could be a problem if you're working with singletons. With dependency injection frameworks, you always have the possibility to define singletons, but make sure if you have different object graphs, if this is a JVM singleton or an object graph singleton. In this case, you have a module per module per object graph a singleton. Could be cars. But the good thing with this dependency injection framework is that everything will be done during the compile time. This means it will give you the full object graph in a file, and this you could analyze for cycles and all this stuff to optimize the object graphs. Uh, this was DAG1. Google forked all this stuff and make sure that there are a lot of stuff are changed. Um, and they change a little bit. So this is the only difference between DAG1 and DAG2 that's in the moment is important. So you will hold your modules and the object graph is removed. So if you have an old project using Dagger 1, you can easily convert it to Dagger 2 and the object graph itself is moved and then you have a lot of builder methods or builder stuff created. This means you're creating uh, components and the other thing is you're defining factory methods and then the whole stuff is done. If you're comparing those, only to proceed once, the Dagger 1 bootstrap would be the object graph, and then you're getting something from Dagger 2. You will get the builder method that was uh, generated, and then you can add the module, and then you can use the factory method. Well, if you like one or two, it's your thing. There's one thing, if you have dependency injection framework, um, there is HK2. Anyone knows HK2? Who knows Glassfish? Yeah, it was part of it, huh? So, the interesting thing here, so Boon was based only on reflection. Dagger is bo um, uh, based only on annotation processing. This one is an SE dependency injection framework, but will give you a lot of things you can uh, deal with. Uh, so if you're building an SE application and you need something like service, run levels, all this, this could be a good thing to check. There's only one small thing. 
I think it's from Oracle, huh? the Sage Code here. Huh? So you must mark an interface with add contract, and you must mark an implementation with add service, and both must fit together. It's OK. So you're defining the whole object graph again. But the biggest problem is maybe your legacy code is not able to deal with this because you have to change everything. Sometimes if you don't have to change it, this dependency injection framework is no ch uh, choice, uh, no possible way, because you definitely have to work on the source code. OK, there are some, some interesting things, or the main things. You can add inject a business service. As usual, you can have a provider. It's something like a producer. And you can inject explicit implementations, it's OK. And you have an iterator over all implementations. So you can say, OK, give me all. And then you're going through all implementations to build something. Sometimes you need it. But the most important thing or interesting thing here is you have a custom injection resolver. So this at inject you can customize. And this is sometimes really nice. So for this, you have to create a new marker for alternative inject or my inject, and then you have to implement the inject resolver. That's it. And then you can completely customize all the thing, but use the infrastructure. The main thing here is that looking at all this dependency injection frameworks, I, I really would like to have some easier way, because all this dependency injection frameworks force me to uh, define it in with qualifiers, or define it in source code with building up object graphs, or define it in XML or whatever. So I want to have minimum binding code. This is boring code. The next one is it must be ready for customizing, because I know that something will be different. But no one of them give me a model validating. What's model validating? Model validating could be if you have an interface and an implementation, it fits. OK. But it could be if you have, in this database, three customers, you need three implementations. So business model validating, part of the dependency injection framework. Nobody has this. A clear life cycle, OK, we all want to have a clear life cycle, clear error messages, uh, this for sure. Easy debugging. Anyone try to debug dependency injection frameworks? Who? Who? Well, especially if they are working with bytecode manipulation. Nice breakpoint inside something generated. But I want to have a dynamic context. All the dependency injection frameworks until now have, during startup or during bootstrapping of this infrastructure, nearly all decisions done. The only way, mostly, is that you can say, go through this producer, insert the producer. Now you can decide whatever you want. Then you're writing a bunch of infrastructure code. And then you can make it a little bit more dynamic. Maybe we can do it a little bit easier. You can use dependency injection framework for mocking. A service that's injecting a service that's injecting a service, and the last one is doing a remote call to the customer. And I want to be as near as possible at the business code. I only want to have inside my geonities at inject my service I want to test, and then make sure that only the last inject deep, deep down is mocked by something. And I don't want to mock the whole hierarchy with Mokito or so. All right. Test configurations. And sometimes dependency injection is easy to lead to functional aspects without saying it to it. Who's dealing with very senior developers, old fashioned, and says, oh, this functional style, if you're coding, until you're coding my grip, no, whatever. So easy plugin development, OK, everything must be marked. So minimum binding code, what does it mean? If you analyze a little bit this at inject, and you want to have something like this, JSR299, you have an interface. And the easiest thing we could have and see nearly everybody was able to deal with is one interface and one implementation. This is an easy relationship, so you can deal with this. If you have a second one, we saw that mostly you have to mark it with some stuff. I don't want to have it. So how to deal with this? This is a big question. So this must be easy. How to decide? It was one of the first questions. Huh? Let's say you have something like this. You have an interface. And this interface would go to a class resolver if and only if you have two implementations. Otherwise, you're skipping this one and say, now I will decide with every at inject what could be the right implementation. 
Not bad. Inside your production code, you have only an interface and an implementation. And inside your test code, you have a second implementation. And only inside your JUnit test, you have a class resolver that makes this decision. Then you have everything in one JUnit test. OK. But if you're dealing, for example, with producers, then you normally need something like, OK, I have one producer for production, one for customer A, B, C, or whatever. And the same you could do with a producer resolver. The nice thing is that analyzing this thing in a few projects, this was enough. If you have a hierarchy like this, you could do normally nearly everything. If you find something that's not possible to, to build with this, please let me know. I want to improve the code. At Inject, everybody would say, OK, I have an instance like virtual proxy. But no dependency injection framework will give you the possibility to customize this proxy. For example, activate metrics here, because I don't want to do it with bytecode and, uh, manipulation, because I want to get rid during runtime this measurements. Or maybe if I'm dealing with um, logging, same. Logging on, logging off, quite often I see I'm entering this method. I'm leaving this method log statements. Huh? Or if this is a virtual proxy, this nearly everybody would say you have a virtual proxy. But if you have a virtual proxy, um, well, so many types of virtual proxies. Huh? For example, is this a static generated virtual proxy or a dynamic based virtual proxy or whatever? And what's a concurrency strategy? So with all this, why not making something like inject proxy and then give some hints? And even this is too much thing or too much technical aspects inside your code. So why not deciding or declaring it at runtime? Something like DI, please activate metrics for this interface. And every implementation now will be wrapped in a metrics proxy. And if you don't want to have this metrics again, deactivate this and with every new inject, the metrics proxy is far away. OK, so you can switch on and off in production systems. And the same with logging, for example, if you want to dig down in something. How to create proxies? You can build proxies based on dynamic proxies, on annotation processing, or at runtime, creating source code, compiling, give it to the class loader. These are three good ways to create proxies. Which one is right for your project? Or if you want to combine all the strategies, for example, it must be your decision. If you want to play a little bit around with proxies, because dependency injection is more or less a practical usage of proxies, you can play with this open source framework. I was writing with Heinz Kappel the book about proxies and all this stuff I built like a small framework. You can play around here with this stuff. So the next thing is clear lifecycle. I think post-construct is definitely enough. And checking about active module, the active module would need the possibility to, to insert your own rules and at runtime add rules and remove rules to validate the new module because the module you can change if you have the whole reflection inside a meta model. So this one would be nice. Oh, I have to hurry up. Your B is coming soon. OK, and the same with scopes. What's the right place to define scopes? I think get rid of this technical stuff like at inject scope because you don't know if this is the right scope. For example, this is a singleton. Don't write it there at the injection point. Maybe the implementation don't fits to a singleton. Or writing the scope at an interface. You don't know if the implementation fits to the scope you're putting at the interface. So you have to get rid of it because you have different implementations. Or the other way around is you can mark the scope normally at the implementation itself. I think everything is wrong. Get rid of it. Make sure that all these technical aspects are not inside your business code. Try to remove all this stuff. Because you don't know if it is the right scope. If you're deciding it now, it could be right. But it's normally not. So the main thing I, I was playing around is try to activate scopes for interfaces, and then every implementation would be with this scope. Or for a special implementation, make it dynamic at runtime. And then you could do something like, well, decide 
for different implementations, different scopes. And scopes could be a pool scope, method scope, whatever scope. Okay, and this at runtime. Last but not least, what's the right thing we have? Desktop application, web server, IoT, whatever. Dependency injection itself will give you a very small infrastructure, but you can write dynamic systems. For example, you have an implementation of an algorithm that's using a lot of memory and is fast, and the other one is using nearly no memory and it's very, very slow. You have a server and the load is increasing, and then you're crossing a border, and immediately you would say, okay, no, no requests anymore, or starting a new instance. Sometimes it's easy to say with the next inject, change the implementation so that you're using less memory, but it's a little bit slower. And then you're reconfiguring the system at runtime time until the load is decreasing, then you're switching to the fast implementation again. And with this you can build dynamic reconfigure, uh, or reconfigured systems at runtime. And this is only part of a little bit dependency injection because you only have to make the decision What's the right implementation as near as possible at the time point of invocation? And you can do it with CDI, you can do it with different other things. It depends a little bit. Time life, it depends if you have constructor injection or bytecode manipulation or whatever. These are the frameworks we had a small view on. I would say, if you want to play with the last one, the proxy builder will give you the basic infrastructure for proxies. Otherwise, you can play a little bit around with this dynamic dependency injection. I'll try to, to build this one. If you have questions through this, please let me know. We are using this heavily, but I want to improve all these things. And it's time for beer. Yes, thanks.